So have you ever wondered what the legal status is of your TRT, testosterone replacement therapy? We're going to discuss it after this, so keep watching. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of Balance for Hormones, where we help men and women on their journey to optimal hormone balance. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and leaving comments on your experiences. So today, we're here with Rick Collins. He is a lawyer, attorney in the United States, who focuses on um, the legality behind uh, testosterone, uh, steroids, bodybuilding. He has a column in muscular development. Uh, very honored to have him here today uh, to discuss um, the legality of testosterone replacement because many men are always wondering, is it legal to start testosterone therapy and in, in what context? So uh, Rick, uh, thanks, thanks for coming on. Mike, thank you for having me. Sorry. So um, testosterone in the U.S. So testosterone is a Schedule Three controlled substance in the U.S. What does that mean? It means that it can only be prescribed for a legitimate medical purpose in the usual course of a doctor's uh, business. So um, luckily, testosterone replacement therapy is a medical need. It's a medical purpose. So if a person has symptoms associated with low testosterone, whether it's libido related or other, other types of um, issues, physical symptoms, and the person has low testosterone when tested, um, free total testosterone, then they can see their doctor and talk to their doctor about a prescription. And if the doctor feels that that prescription is appropriate for that particular patient, um, that there's no contraindications, that it's appropriate, then that doctor will give the patient that prescription. So you mentioned this, this range of, of blood tests, and that seems to be kind of a legal status then in the United States, that it has to fit within a certain range, or is there some variance on where that range can fall, and, and who, who's regulating that? Right, so um, controlled substances have greater restrictions than other types of medicine. It's not like a, uh, an antibiotic or, or cortisone. Because it's a controlled substance, there's a little bit greater review. We have the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA in the United States. The drugs police. At. The drugs police, yeah. So, so they make sure that the prescriptions for testosterone are actual medical-based prescriptions, not a prescription based on something else. So, for example, somebody who just wants to get bigger, stronger, leaner. That's important. That distinction is really what separates TRT from the illegal use of testosterone. So a patient if they went to the doctor because they had, I think you mentioned in previous um, uh, talks about uh, body dys dys um, dysmorphia, uh, that's, no, that's not a legal status, at least yet, for getting a testosterone yeah. prescription. And I've been giving that lecture yeah. now a few times, and, and it's an interesting issue um, because what you mentioned, muscle dysmorphia, is actually a mental health disorder where a person has an incongruence between their physical body and how they see themselves. And so they want to get more muscle. They see themselves as almost like a reverse anorexic in the way that an anorexic would, would see herself or himself as, as never um, thin enough, as always being fat, even at 60 pounds or 70 pounds of body weight. Muscle dysmorphia is, I'm never big enough. I'm always, I'm, you know, I'm not sufficiently um, muscular. So, um, so whether that will ultimately be a basis for prescribing testosterone, um, it certainly is for gender dysphoria, which is a mental health issue where a person sees themselves as in the wrong body for gender purposes. In other words, a person who is assigned female at birth, female, and wants to become more masculine, wants to either become a man, or just be more further along that non-binary spectrum toward maleness, it is common for that person to be prescribed testosterone in order to change their body to conform with how they see themselves. And the DA isn't so focused on that group to have the testosterone. Yeah, I haven't, I've heard no issues with, with that. Um, there have been some hormone replacement clinics in the U.S. that have run afoul of the DEA um, because they weren't doing the sorts of things that you would expect a doctor or a medical clinic to do in, in actual legitimate medical practice.
So were they weren't using blood uh, blood testing or using a certain guidance? Right. Well, you've, you've, I've seen the full spectrum. Okay. I've seen situations where they um, basically used a sales team on the phone, and the patient would simply call, wouldn't speak to a doctor, would speak to a salesperson. Um, that conversation would lead to basically, what do you want? Oh, I want some mandrolone, I want some testosterone, yeah. I want some moldenone, and that then became rubber stamped by maybe a doctor who was at the tail end of his practice or was not really paying attention, was just stamping out prescriptions you know, all day long without ever seeing patients, without getting any kind of blood work, without any kind of screening for contraindications. Um, essentially, the TRT equivalent of a pill mill. There certainly are legitimate TRT clinics here who are not doing what I just suggested before at all. Uh, and doctors, some of them are endocrinologists, not all of them are, but who are actually practicing good medicine to make people's hormones optimal so that they feel good and can function properly, and, uh, and that's obviously a good thing. So for TRT then, for, uh, for patients go on uh, testosterone replacement therapy, what should they look out for as far as, um, I suppose, the clinics or, or uh, what kind of documentation would they want to have uh, if they're traveling? Even? Right. Well, well, in terms of getting a, a clinic, you certainly don't want somebody, you, you don't want to go to a clinic that um, just advertises and, and you never actually see a doctor and you talk to somebody who's not even in the health field and where you're telling the clinic what you want as opposed to them telling you what you should be prescribed. That should be, you know, that's the equivalent of, of like I said before, a pill mill. Um, in terms of documentation, it is a controlled substance. And so if you're traveling with medication in the United States, you want to prevent uh, authorities from thinking that you're smuggling drugs or have a drug that's outside of a lawful prescription. So I always advise to you know, to as much information as you can provide about the legitimacy of that prescription is what you should have with it. Maybe rubber banding a letter from the doctor, maybe the original prescription itself, keeping it in the right packaging, not changing any of the packaging, with your name on that packaging. All of those things, not having a, a very large uh, amount, um, all of those things I think would um, let the, the authorities know that this is a valid prescription for you that you have. So one of the things we do for our patients is everyone who comes through, obviously the prescriptions are, have the label from the pharmacy on them with the patient's name. Uh, they also receive a consent to treatment plan. So uh, the, the doctor signs this saying you've been prescribed X, Y, and Z. You're happy with the way the consultation went. You understand the risks and benefits and you're prescribed this much for this quantity, this dosing, and, and, uh, and they, get, they sign it and the doctor signs it. So it's really the gold standard for uh, consenting uh, part of the process, and that's one of the three consents that, that we do. So here in the U.S., we're a very litigious society, and, and people are always looking to sue if there's anything that goes wrong and somebody can be blamed. And so there is litigation in the United States involving testosterone, testosterone replacement therapy. Um, look, a certain percentage of the male population is going to have a heart attack. And that may happen if you're not on testosterone, and if you then go on it, it could happen while you're on testosterone. Um, but of course, there's you know, lawyers, uh, including class action lawyers, who have seen this as an opportunity. And there have been a whole lot of, in the United States, particularly in Chicago, they've been sort of consolidated as a class action suit for cardiac risks involving testosterone replacement. And um, you know, those those cases are pending. Um, you know. That's the science that I've seen. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, obviously, so I stay in my lane. Um, but uh, I've spoke to many doctors who are very familiar with the literature, and I've spent a lot of time looking at the literature, and I have some very serious questions about the legitimacy of a lot of those lawsuits. It seems very skewed. And I, you know, I've seen the data as well, and you, you know that it, some of it shows when you're at a high risk of, of heart disease, when you have low testosterone, not, not uh, optimal testosterone. So, um, that's one of those questions I'm asking. Oh, so, anyway, in, in the UK, what I was going to, going to mention is you, you mentioned a, a Schedule 3 for testosterone in the USA. In the UK, it's a Schedule 4. And there is no illegality about possessing 
uh, testosterone uh, without a prescription, provided it's in medicinal form. Uh, I think that's what the, the laws are part of the, the Drugs Misuse Act. I can't remember which year it was. So I think every country has its own laws with respect to drug schedules and with respect to controlled substances. The United States is probably one of the more draconian <laughs> environments yeah. for drugs. We started a war on drugs under our President Nixon many, many years ago, and that's continued for 40 plus years since then. And so uh, we were more aggressive than most other countries. I know that my, my friend from Greece says that testosterone is available over the counter. Dr. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, and the, the idea of that yeah. in the United States is just so foreign to us. Um, but, but in the UK, uh, as I understand it, possession uh, is treated very differently than it is in the United States. But that's true even in Canada, just to our north. It, it is a much... Uh, much less draconian, much less um, punitive approach. We're just beginning in this country maybe to, to rethink. Uh, there's been a little bit of a rollback of the war on drugs in recent years. I think we're beginning to recognize that we may have gone a little bit too far in some respects. Uh, Oregon is a state that just recently decriminalized uh, and looks at drugs more as a public health issue. Um, so maybe we're, we're going in that direction. One of the things that's popped in the news in the UK recently is that HRT may be offered over the counter uh, so that women can have access, especially when they reach menopause. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, part of HRT for women, if you do modern HRT, includes testosterone. So the right. question is, will they make testosterone over the counter based on uh, menopause? Right. But my guess is, and what we've heard from the recent uh, news reports, is that uh, it will be a low dose and it will be a vaginal estrogen that will be available. I see. And not because there can be risks with estradiol as well, Correct. clotting it as right. one of them. So. Well, sure. I mean, every drug has its risks. You know, there's no completely safe drug. Um, and when you said before informed consent, that's that's important with respect to any medication or any prescription. Making sure that the patient fully recognizes that every every drug can have potential side effects. Uh, but if the benefits outweigh those side effects, and if the quality of life is something that is is improved by the use of that drug, then then it's it's a, a win. Yeah, and that's what we try to do. We've got three different steps, and I think we go, like you could tell us, we go above and beyond. We have uh, the generalized consent form that talks about what the process is like going through our service, plus uh, general consent around you know, TRT treatment, testosterone treatment, side effects, risks, general risks. The next step is when they have a consultation with the doctor, uh, the doctor goes over the consents and gains that performed consent based on their discussions. And the third consent, as I mentioned earlier, was the um, consent to treatment plan, where the patient agrees then after the consultation, doctor signs and patient signs. And so, I don't know, does that sound like so Well, just, just in general yeah. terms, the, the more dialogue occurs between the patient and the doctor, the more the patient is advised about all of the potential risks and side effects that are associated with any medicine. I'm speaking broadly here, the better. Um, the, the doctor and the patient should be a team that work together to the benefit of the patient's health. And, and that's, that's what we try to do. And we also at Balance Performance have a coaching service where we've got ex-doctors, um, some ex-nurses, and, and other uh, you know, TRT advocates have been on it themselves. We call them you know, patient to patient advocates that when they first you know, contact us, they're there to kind of understand, being in the set of eyes and ears for the doctor, but then they get moved over to the doctor, and the doctor's maintaining the management and care you know, through, through our clinic. And one other thing I want to talk to you about, and it's, you mentioned it, the attitude of Europe in the previous um, talk, was, uh, and we've noticed this as well, we've got some patients from Sweden, um, and one, one patient, but take, a couple of our patients that were getting prescriptions within the European Union, sent from a European Union pharmacy to Sweden or Denmark or Norway, though Denmark is a bit, um, I would say, more laid back compared to Sweden. Um, but it's this kind of interesting thing, and what, what we've heard, and you've mentioned as well, uh, patients um, are visually uh, looked at as if they're an abuser, or not even an abuser, if they're just on testosterone, they look too muscly, more muscly than they should. Right. Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a stronger anti-muscularity um, bent in certain places in Scandinavia, uh, where there's almost a muscle profiling of, of people based on hypermuscularity as being associated with steroids or drugs. Um, also, in some European countries, there's more of a relationship between the police, the law enforcement folks, 
and the anti-doping authorities. And some, they're essentially part of the same unit. Yeah. And so when they work together that way, you've got a, a much higher potential for some sort of law enforcement activity. Here in the United States, obviously, it, it's very different. We have a, a U.S. anti-doping agency, which deals with doping in sports, but we have obviously federal and state law enforcement authorities that are not specifically connected to anti-doping. Well, well, that's, I think, it's going to be very hard, maybe we'll, we'll start to get past it, but it's going to be very hard to destigmatize testosterone because of the way the media has connected it to doping and cheating in sports. You know, estrogen is not a controlled substance. Testosterone is a controlled substance. And in this country, in large part because a Canadian sprinter by the name of Ben Johnson in 1988 ran really fast, broke all the world records, and, and cheated uh, and won against Carl Lewis, the American, and then tested positive for stenozolol, for Winstrel. And so that created, I think, the ball rolling that was the, the initial catalyst for Congress making testosterone a controlled substance in the very first place. And so whenever you hear about testosterone in a um, athletic or, or you know, muscle component, it's always linked to cheating. It's always linked to the latest steroid scandal. Yes, that's unfortunate because it's not what testosterone is about. It's about you know, healthy living, optimizing oneself. Um, and getting back on the fun legal part about the U.S. versus maybe the U.K. on the legal system, what we find, you know, as a clinic, we have to uh, belong to a regulator called the Care Quality Commission, in which we are. Well, you certainly want to make sure that anybody who's doing TRT to a patient is knowledgeable in the area and, and is not just somebody who's, who's set up shop yeah. and has no idea what they're doing. Um, obviously, it's, it's evolving, and there are different theories on, you know, how much testosterone is appropriate for a given patient um, or whether there should be anti-estrogens to deal with certain aspects of it. And, you know, hormones can be a tricky thing. Yeah. So um, obviously somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing should not be in the business in the first place. Uh, that's absolutely right. And then finally, um, going back, back to the regulator, there's a whole other, like the legal system, it's not as litigious in, in the UK as it is in the US, but rather there are regulators that kind of regulate everything, mm -hmm. um, including the doctors, and the doctors are, are, have to report to the General Medical Council. But what we find is that the practice has been curtailed because there was one doctor that was struck off, that's what they call if you're not fit to practice in the UK, uh, for prescribing selenium to a thyroid patient. Mm. Or, or, and in many of the cases don't come from actual um, patients' complaints. They come from other doctors, GPs, that are making complaints against the doctor. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on that kind of system. So in this country, when I've seen clinics or physicians in the TRT space that get jammed up for one reason or another, um, it can come from a patient complaint or, or an adverse event that happens to a patient, maybe not having anything to do with the TRT prescription, but maybe the, the, the widow um, perceives that it is. Um, so I've seen that, um, and I've seen medical licensing boards, which are kind of the regulators of medicine on a state-by-state -state basis here in the U.S., um, look at some doctors who are involved in TRT, and they've looked at their records, and, and they often try to distinguish, well, is it good medicine? Is, is, this, is this legitimate medicine, or is this just providing an anabolic steroid to people who want it. And so I've seen them look at things like the age of the patients, um, the condition of the patients, the blood work of the patients, um, what drugs are being prescribed. I've seen doctors who've had to um, explain and justify why they were, for example, prescribing Anadrol to a female who was competing in bodybuilding or why a 20-year-old uh, male was being prescribed uh, a dose of testosterone that was clearly going to be super physiologic. Or, um, you know, I've also seen situations where when a TRT clinic opens, uh, sometimes people who are very involved in physical activities will certainly, you know, will, will begin to go there and try to get prescriptions. And before you know it, the waiting room of the clinic is filled with bodybuilders, police officers, firefighters, all in, in 
healthy condition, all weighing 240 pounds with 12% body fat. And that becomes a red flag. Um, also marketing. I've seen TRT clinics here in the United States that use pictures of bodybuilders as their main uh, calling card, um, which you know, may attract interest by regulating bodies, wondering, is this is this really for men's health? There's nothing wrong with showing a fit person. I mean, you could be more, being on TRT will make you more fit. Um, but if it's a bunch of people who are, you know, involved in powerlifting and, and you know, competition in physique sports, sometimes regulators can begin to wonder, you know, is this really for medical purposes or is this for performance purposes? And here in the U.S., that's really what distinguishes a legitimate prescription for testosterone from an illegitimate one. For medical purposes, fine. For performance purposes, not fine. And, and what role does um, harm reduction have? In, in, uh, you mentioned there are people maybe mostly, um, but they've been doing things uh, black market, and then we know that's obviously an illegal way to do sure. testosterone treatment. Right. Um, what What should a doctor or clinic do when when patients either should they have a washout period to, to or should they not? Or? Yeah, that's that's really a medical question, and the doctor needs to um, abide by proper medical course of treatment. I, I've seen, sadly, that some doctors are afraid to even get involved with a patient who is using anabolic steroids illegally, black market steroids, for the purposes of monitoring that patient because the doctor is afraid, well, if I monitor the patient, I'm, I'm now um, acquiescing in the conduct and maybe even facilitating and encouraging that patient to continue using black market steroids by ameliorating and reducing his side effects. Um, obviously, that's not that's the opposite of harm reduction, right? Because right. then you're and 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 that is problematic. And I think in part the our anabolic steroid control act in in the U.S. has driven a wedge between the medical community and the the black market, the not TRT yeah. but the cosmetic or performance users of the drugs in a way that does does not uh, meet harm reduction standards at all. Uh, I think that the wedge that was drawn, you know, put into place actually makes the steroid use more dangerous for people who are using it because they're not getting monitored. They're not typically uh, having cholesterol, prostate exams, you know, blood pressure, um, you know, looking for contraindications, all the things that having a doctor in place would be. There are a few doctors here in the U.S. here who, you know, will work with non-medical steroid users to try to wean them off um, and put them on proper TRT, um, sort of post-use, uh, you know, maybe after a former steroid user. Um, and, and as you know, Look, you know, people who abuse steroids for many years can compromise their own endogenous production of testosterone, and some of them wind up needing to be on TRT for life because of the, the steroid use. And, and it's important, I think, that those people do have knowledgeable, you know, caring physicians who can help them. Yeah, that's important. So, well, this has been a really informative uh, video. I really appreciate you uh, coming on. And um, you know, for everyone watching, um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and uh, do subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Mike. Good, good. Thank you.